Okay, good morning everyone. Hopefully that's the right link for the attendance sheet. Um, you are now working, uh, starting to work on your final project. You're working on the first of four uh, deliverables. A couple things uh, I didn't say last time about the final project. Uh, if you check out the subreddit, some of you may have noticed this already. Just beyond uh, module O, the final project, there's module P, which is tips and tricks. Uh, PyroSim was designed to hide most of the nitty-gritty details of PyBullet, the raw physics engine, from you. But uh, many of you are going to need various aspects of uh, PyBullet for your uh, final project. Have a read through the tips and tricks. There's a few hacks and patches in there that allow you will allow you to access more parts of the physics engine that are that are currently made available to you uh, in PyroSim. One that might be particularly useful is uh, the state of the earth, uh, the state of the world module here, which will allow you at each and every time step during your simulation to capture the position and orientation of objects in your world.sdf file. That can be useful for various things. Some of you might look into uh, evolving robots that avoid obstacles. You can get the position of one of the links of your robot. You can get the position of one of the obstacles in the world and take the distance between those two objects and incorporate that into your fitness function for obstacle avoidance, for example. You can also take the distance between a point in your robot and an external object to simulate a light sensor. If you assume that one of the objects is a light emitter, you can take that distance. One over that distance squared is a pretty good approximation of the distance of your robot from a light source. Other things you can do with that as well. Okay, so have a, have a read through there um, as you're thinking about your final project. And if you don't see something in tips, if you're looking for some aspect of the physics engine that you do not see exposed in tips and tricks, shoot me an email or a Teams DM and I should be able to point you where in PyBullet you can actually pull out that information. Any questions about that? Final project, deliverable one, all good? Okay, so back to uh, open challenges uh, in the field, the particular open challenge of trying to cross the reality gap. And we made it through partway through lecture 17 last time, the Resilient Machines Project. This is my own humble contribution to trying to cross uh, the reality gap. And just to remind you of the basic idea behind the Resilient uh, Machines Project is that we have, sorry, that's the wrong, that's your version of the slides. There's my version of the slides. Uh, the Resilient Machines Project, the algorithm running on board this robot is known as the estimation exploration algorithm. And I realized there was a bit of a typo last time on slide four when I introduced you to this algorithm. I told you that there are two evolutionary algorithms, which is true. One of them is evolving populations of simulators, and the fitness of any given simulator is how accurate it is. There is a second evolutionary algorithm, which should look more familiar to you. This is evolving populations of controllers and assessing their fitness by downloading them onto a robot in an evolved simulator. Last time I told you that uh, this is the exploration part of the exploration estimation. It's actually the exploitation part. We haven't actually got to the exploration part yet. So exploitation is sort of the short for, is the, the nickname for the second evolutionary algorithm, which is exploiting the evolved simulator. It's exploiting it to evolve controllers for the physical robot. So estimation, estimate the robot or estimate the robot's interactions with its environment, build that into a simulator exploitation, use the most accurate simulator to evolve controllers. There is a third piece to this algorithm, which is the exploration part. But we haven't got there yet. We'll get there in a mere moment. So far, so good. Just wanted to clarify that. OK. OK. So uh, in order to show you how these two uh, evolutionary algorithms work together, we're looking, at, we're looking at a series of uh, videos and animations taken from one run of the estimation exploration last time. We started with this robot that knows a little bit about itself and, and a little bit about how it can interact with the environment, but a lot is unknown to this robot at the outset. 
What are some things that the robot knows, and what are the, some of the things that the robot does not need at the beginning? Well, it knows the shape and mass of each of the bits. It doesn't know where they are. In it, the it doesn't know how they're, how they're attached together, which, of course, would be an easy thing for us to build in the simulator. This was just sort of a test to see whether it could figure it out. Yeah, it's just, uh, it looks like they're free floating. This was just us being lazy with the visualizer. Okay. Another thing that it knows or that we told it, or an inductive bias, if you know that term from machine learning, is that all the pieces are contiguous. It's not two robots made up of five links in one and four links in another. What are some other things that the robot knows and doesn't know at the outset? Absolutely, yeah. It doesn't exactly know which motor is supposed to fire for some reason, so it knows kind of its default position. It, it, it will, but it doesn't know yet. At this point in time, the physical robot hasn't even moved yet. Okay. So as you mentioned, the ro physical robot has no sensor data yet. It has no motor data. This is another version of baby bot. It's just been quote unquote born. It hasn't even moved yet. It's going to move in order to collect enough information to figure out these unknowns, which in this case are how these part pieces are put together. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so as I showed you last time, it starts by performing a random action, in this case, rotating motors one and five down, all the other motors up. It has two vestibular sensors on board that record how much the main body tilts left and right, how much the main body tilts forward and back. So now it has one piece of data, one sensor motor relationship, motors one and five down, I tilted 30 degrees to the right, and again, because of my shoddy camera work here, you'll notice that the estimation algorithm, which is trying to estimate the robot and its interaction with the environment, is finding many simulators or many models in which the green block rotates 30 degrees to the right. Yeah. The robot knows at this point that it has many different explanations of self, but there can only be one explanation of self. It can't simultaneously look like this and like this and like this. So the physical robot goes back and performs a second action. And in this case, this action causes it to tilt to the left. And now it's going to start up the, ex uh, the estimation algorithm again. And it's going to evaluate each simulator n times, where n is the number of physical actions that it's performed so far. And it's going to measure the virtual sensor data, how much the virtual robot tilts left and right and forward and back, and compare that to the physical data. And the fitness of the simulator is to minimize that distance between virtual data and uh, virtual sensor data and physical sensor data. So it does keep in memory like the data from it keeps in memory data from previous runs, exactly. So the physical robot is recording its experiences. I did this and I got that sensory result. I did that and I got that sensory result. And it's using that data to try and sort of reverse engineer an explanation of itself. So far, so good? Okay. I, show, I think this was the video we ended with last time. So the physical robot is, alter, is alternating between perform a, a, a physical action, run the estimation algorithm for a while, physical action, estimation, physical action, estimation. And this video was actually taken after the eighth physical action. You're going to watch a bunch of simulations here. And was just pointed out last time, we're only watching one of the eight trials for each simulation. And the reason we picked this eighth trial is because during this eighth phase of this evolutionary algorithm, suddenly through mutation, there's a model that's pretty accurate that explains almost all of the eight actions. And that simulation uh, produces an offspring. And there's some mutations that produce a pretty good explanation right at the end there. That explanation that's on the screen right now, that explains almost all of, the eight, uh, uh, all of the eight experiences from the physical robot. 
But you'll notice that even this model or this simulation is not a perfect reflection of the robot. What's the difference between top right and bottom left? The model's still not perfect. It's got all the pieces, all nine pieces in more or less the right place. There are like 93 angles between the, the arms, like there are in the, um, the actual robot. Yeah, exactly, right? The arms are a little bit bent, so they're not perfect. So the, the virtual robot, when it performs the same action that the physical robot performed, maybe the virtual robot tilts 27 degrees to the right, where the physical robot actually tilted 30 degrees to the right. So an error of three degrees, for example. It's not perfect. No model, no simulation is ever going to be perfect. So a challenge for the robot and a challenge for all of us, we also create models of ourselves and the world around us, is when do you stop? When is a model good enough? It's another important aspect here to think about. Okay, what I left you with last time is the question about how does the physical robot choose what action to perform next? It's allowed every once in a while to perform a physical action. A relatively smart thing to do actually is perform a random action. That's usually pretty good. What's the worst possible thing the physical robot could do? If you were the physical robot and you had done some estimation of self and you were allowed to perform a new action, what is the worst possible thing you could do? the exact same thing that you did before, right? Assuming you and the world is relatively deterministic, you're gonna get exactly the same result and you've wasted one of your opportunities to perform a new action, right? So worst thing you can do is do the same thing or do nothing, both bad. Doing something at random is pretty good because if you're doing something at random, you're unlikely to do the same thing twice. Turns out there's something you can do that's even smarter. Anyone figured it out? Or cheated and read ahead in the slides? So if you have symmetry, could you also have a way of doing actions that are symmetrically the same? Possibly, yeah. But symmetrically, the si you don't know you're symmetric at this point, right? So the tricky part, remember, is that at this point in time, the robot doesn't really know how it's put together. If it knew it was symmetric, then yes, maybe there's some tricks it could perform. What do you do if you don't have a good understanding of self? So this is an important question. We ended last time with developmental psychology. There's a lot of interest in what human infants or young animals do as you explore your world. There's lots of things you can do that are dangerous. There's lots of things you can do that are wastes of time. You don't learn much from them. How does an infant or an animal choose what to do next? Is it just flailing around at random, perhaps? In theory, you can do something better. Okay, so you could act like a scientist and try and uh, isolate your variables. Rotate motor one, rotate motor one plus motor five, rotate motor one plus motor seven and continue. That's a little bit better than random. Turns out there's something even better. I'll give you a hint. Remember that early on, the robot has multiple self models. It has m multiple, multiple models that all explain the physical experiences so far. At this point in time, from the robot's point of view, these are all correct. Turns out that the robot, and in theory, humans and animals might be able to use multiple models of self that all explain your physical experience so far. You can use those models to decide or determine what to do next. Any ideas? I mean, it's possible the robot can just have certain models and say, if I look like this, then this action should look like this. Okay. So choose your next action based on your current model. Yep. You're going to just pick an action at random. Yeah, exactly. So we're getting closer. That's part of the answer. We're going to use these models to uh, come up with a new action to perform next. So let's imagine at this point in time, the physical robot dreams up uh, a re an action, rotate motors eight, seven and eight, let's say. 
it sends that action to the first model. And in the first model, motors seven and eight rotate down, all the other motors rotate up, and that model rotates, produces some virtual vestibular data. You get some virtual sensor data from that model. You rotate 14 degrees to the left and 27 degrees to the right, okay? You take the same action, seven and eight, and you sit, send it into the second model, the other one that's also correct, and that model tilts 27 degrees to the right and two degrees forward. We have one action and we're sending it to all the correct models at the moment. And all those models are making a prediction about what would happen if the physical robot rotated motors seven and eight upward. What can we do with all of that information? It still doesn't tell us whether the act, action of rotating motors seven and eight up is a good action, that it'll give us a lot of new experience. There's one more step we need, the robot needs to take. We have one action, we fed it to n different models. We've got n different predictions back. We could run it on the physical robot, but we don't know yet whether that action is a good action. It's possible that the, the robot already performed that action, right? That would be a bad action. Would you want the predictions to all be fairly different? Would you want all the predictions to be different? That's, that's it exactly, yeah? Think about, uh, imagine that the robot had performed, had rotated motors seven and eight upward already. By definition, if these models are all accurate, they all have explained that action already. They will all give exactly the same result if you supply that action to these models. They all say, we know, we know, we've evolved to explain that action. We, we all agree that the robot will tilt this much to the left, this much forward, which is what the physical robot actually did, right? So that would be the worst thing you could do is perform an action in which the models all agree about that action. Everybody see that? Okay. So imagine that the robot has not performed uh, rotation seven and eight previously. We feed seven and eight to these N models. One model says, I think this is what's gonna happen. Second model says, you're crazy. That's not what's gonna happen. This is what's gonna happen. They're all going to disagree in their predictions. That's a proxy, it's sort of, sort of a stand-in for knowing how good an action will be, where the quality of an action is, it's gonna provide some new information, a new, it's gonna provide the robot with a new experience. Yeah. Turns out that you also do this in some form in your day-to-day -day life. Anybody think of an example of this? You're performing an action in the real world where you're not sure about the result, and kind of intuitively, you're disagreeing with yourself. I think this is what's gonna happen, I think that's what's gonna happen, and that kind of leads you towards performing that action. You pull, uh, you pull an opaque, milk carton out of the fridge. You're not quite sure how much is in it. Obviously, you can kind of feel the weight of the carton. You want to get a sense of roughly how much milk is in there. What do you do? You shake it side to side, right, forward and back. You don't rotate it about its long axis. That action doesn't give you much information, right? It seems funny, why would you do it, right? Intuitively, you are choosing actions that are causing models in your head to disagree. One model in your head says, I think I had a lot of milk yesterday. I think it's pretty empty. We're all tired at this time of the year. You don't really remember. You think actually, I don't remember whether I had a lot of milk yesterday. Maybe it's kind of full. You're not quite sure. You have different ideas about what's going on. You choose a specific action that will give you the right result. There's an infinite number of ways you can manipulate the carton. And most of those will not disambiguate between full, almost full and almost empty, yeah? Okay, this is often known in biology as infotaxis. 
We talked about taxes before, taxes behavior, photo taxes. Remember uh, the Breitenberg vehicles 2A and 2B, the coward and the, uh, what am I missing? The aggressor, right? Toward or away light. You can perform actions that take you towards new information or potentially away from information. What actions, assuming you're trying to learn something, what actions do you perform in the real world to learn or get back as much information as you can about the world? Absolutely. So there's, there's a lot of twists on this. Some actions are so chaotic that whatever results you get back, there's no way for the models to make sense of the information that you're getting, right? You'll notice that the actions that we allow the robot to perform, the space of actions, are relatively gentle. Move and tilt and then stop. Obviously, this thing can stand up and shake and flip, flip over itself and do all sorts of things. It's going to be hard for it to interpret that, that information. So yes, there's a lot of actions you could perform that aren't that useful. The robot and us are trying to choose the vanishingly small subset of actions that we could perform that give us the information we need at that point in time. At this point in time, in this robot's life, it is trying to determine a, a model of self. Yeah? OK. So uh, I'm going to just. I'm going to just skip ahead for a moment. I'll come back. OK. I just want to skip ahead to slide 22 here for a moment, just to give you an overview, and then we'll come back to that experiment. So we talked already about the estimation algorithm, which is evolving bodies or simulations or simulations, including virtual bodies. And the fitness of any one simulation is the similarity between simulated sensor data and physical sensor data. Right? We're trying to minimize the difference between those two. We have the exploitation algorithm down here, which we've seen many times in this course now. We're evolving populations of controllers. And the fitness of a controller is how fast it causes the virtual robot to move in the best evolved simulator. OK. I lied to you. There's actually three evolutionary algorithms running here. There's the third one, which is the exploration algorithm. The exploration algorithm is, na is so named because this is the robot exploring its world, figuring out what to do to learn about itself and the world. In this case, in the exploration algorithm, it's evolving populations of actions. I'm going to rotate motors 7 and 8 up and motors 1 through 6 down. And the fitness of an action is prediction disagreement. Predictions, predictions of whom or from where. Predictions of the current best models. So as we run the exploration algorithm, we're searching over the space of all possible actions which motors to rotate up, which ones to ro rotate down. And for each action in the population, we supply that action to each of the models. We get back predictions from each of the models. And we compute the amount of disagreement across them. The more disagreement, the more fit that action is. OK, now you've seen all of this the Resilient Machines project. These are all the moving pieces. Any questions at this point? OK. So we've got our upper cycle here. The physical robot performs some action. And then we estimate. It estimates itself for a while. We evolve simulations. We pause the estimation algorithm. We fire up the exploration algorithm. We search over the space of all possible actions and find the one that's most likely to be informative. Take that single action, allow the physical robot to perform that physical action, return to the estimation algorithm, run the estimation algorithm where we're evaluating every simulator twice, keep going until the simulators converge, 
take the current set of simulators, send them to the exploration algorithm. It evolves a new action that causes these models to disagree, and around and around we go. When does this process stop? We're never going to get a perfect model. When does the physical robot say, I know enough about myself. I know that this one is correct. Can you define that in terms of like how long the exploration algorithm has to run to find an actual useful? That's a great, yeah, that's a great idea. So in practice, when you run this algorithm and you watch phase after phase of the exploration algorithm, it gets more and more difficult to find an action that causes the models to disagree. Or if the average amount of disagreement becomes less and less and less. Yep, that, that's one thing you could use. You could look at diminishing returns. As it becomes harder and harder to find an action that extracts new information from the world, you're good. You're ready to move on to using that model to practice actually useful actions, not just learning about self. Other ideas? Okay. Um, so that could be like um, so that you can't ever answer this, but okay. can you do like a small movement when you're expecting a value and you get that value back? Yep. Then it means like that as a whole, like you know what you are. Like you know so if you're right, if your predictions are correct, yeah. right? So you, you could have an action in here in which all the models more or less agree and the physical robot carries it out, and all of those models were right. Yeah, that, that's possible. It could be a small action, you're right. Although, it, there may be another action that causes the models to disagree, and you're gonna get a different result, right? So we've gotta look at, in general, all, not all the actions, but as the exploration algorithm is searching over the space of actions, the actions that it finds, disagreement is becoming less and less and less. What's happening in the estimation algorithm, do you think, as this process continues? As the amount of prediction disagreements are decreasing over here on the ninth, tenth, hundredth, thousandth cycle around here, what's happening in the estimation algorithm? Every time we unpause it and run it for a little bit longer, what's happening? Absolutely, they're converging to one explanation. Right? It becomes harder and harder for this thing to explain 5, 10, 20, 100,000 actions. Harder and harder for this one, this one. They're being cast out of the population. Right, They're getting lower and lower fitness. If you think about it, if these models disagree about a particular action found by the exploration algorithm, we perform that action on the physical robot. If the models disagree, then they can't all be right. When we get the actual result of that action back from the physical robot, many of these models are gonna have been proven wrong and their fitness is going to drop, yeah? It might be that they were all wrong and all their fitnesses drop and they're replaced by mutated children and grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren that are able to explain more of the data. Question. Yeah, Okay, yeah, so things get a little tricky here because we don't have just one evolutionary algorithm at play. At the moment, we just have two alternating back and forth. We're gonna have three in a moment. So do we need something more powerful than a pa parallel hill climber? I was just thinking that you have in your estimation algorithm something that's not being compared to the physical robot, but you can't find one that doesn't agree with the exploration algorithm in the current set. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. So we did not use a parallel hill climber in this actual experiment. We used a more high-powered evolutionary algorithm. Yeah, absolutely. As time goes on, it gets harder and harder to find things that are of use. Yeah? Okay. So what we another way of thinking about what we have here is a co-evolutionary algorithm. And we're not going to talk too much about co-evolution in this course. If you take the evolutionary computation course, you will hear about this uh, this subset of evolutionary algorithms. 
The estimation and exploitation algorithm, or exploration algorithm here, this is an example of a co-evolutionary algorithm. We have two evolving populations that are influencing one another. We have the population of simulations and the population of actions. In nature, there are many co-evolutionary systems. The most obvious one are predators and prey. Yeah? Okay. Co-evolutionary algorithms are interesting for many reasons. One of them is that the fitness landscape, which is this sort of thought experiment we've been using so far, changes. Think about the fitness landscape for a population of predators and a different fitness landscape for a population of prey. Or in our case, think about the fitness landscape for the, the simulations and the fitness landscape for the actions. Let's draw a cartoon fitness landscape for our uh, simulators and another cartoon fitness landscape for our actions. Let's imagine at a given point in time, there are two, uh, there are two simulations. There are two simulations that are relatively, uh, that are equally good at this point in time. They're sitting on two different optima in the fitness landscape. Remember that the vertical axis in a fitness landscape is always fitness. Imagine, I won't draw, I won't draw the fitness landscape for the action, but imagine we take an action, we perform it on the physical robot, and that action is supplied back to the po evolving population of simulations. These two simulations, by definition, disagree about this action, right? One said, I think the physical robot's going to tilt to the left. The other one says, no, 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 I think the robot's going to tilt to the right. They were in disagreement. We get the actual result back. This one said left, this one said right. And the actual answer is the physical robot performed uh, tilted to the right. What happens to the fitness landscape? It's going to actually change. An idea? Absolutely. There's a change in the fitness landscape itself. Up till now, we've assumed a fitness landscape that doesn't change. We just have points that are moving or climbing hills in that fitness landscape. The moment you move to a co-evolutionary system, where evolution in one population influences what happens in the other and vice versa, you can now think about the fitness landscape as a fitness sea. There are waves, and those waves are changing based on what's happening in the other population. Absolutely, yes, but I have not had enough caffeine this morning to work through what happens. But it's enough for our purposes that this is also changing as, as these change. Yeah? Okay. So if we have multiple peaks, if we have multiple simulations sitting on multiple peaks in the estimation algorithm, then that's the robot saying, I've got more work to do, right? I can't be, I can't look simultaneously like this and also like this. So that's the signal we used to keep this process going. Like you mentioned, we could have also used convergence over here towards less and less disagreement. As we repeat this process tens, hundreds, thousands of times, what happens eventually to the shape of the fitness landscape? It's changing, but what shape is it eventually changing into? The landscape itself. For this one. What does the fitness landscape for the simulations look like? Absolutely. It becomes Gaussian or unimodal, right? There's only one peak in this landscape. Everything else becomes harder and harder for everything else to explain all of the data that's come back from the physical robot. This Gaussian curve actually is quite narrow, right? Most of the fitness landscape, most of these things 
cannot explain all of the robot's physical exper experiences. There is only one model, or very slight variations of it, that can explain everything that's going on. In this case, it's the correct model. Yeah? So when infotaxis works, or when a coevolutionary process works in this way, it's actually removing the local optima from one of the populations. Yeah? So you mentioned we need a more high-powered evolutionary algorithm. Yes, maybe, but the real work here is not so much by churning through many, many uh, simulations or many, many actions. It's the interaction with the real world. The fact that this thing has a body and can push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. And if it chooses how to push against the world intelligently, you don't actually need a very high-powered search process in either of these. Right? As long as it's relatively easy to find a good a, an action that can squeeze some more information out of the world, this landscape gets smoother and smoother and smoother, and all the hills get pushed down, this starts to get more and more peaked, and around you go. Yeah? Okay. All right, so let's back up now and actually see this in action. Uh, I'll back up to, where were we here? Uh, we were at this point here. This is the eighth round of this cycle. The robot discovers at this point that only that model can explain all eight actions. I'm going to jump ahead to the 16th trial. This is the robot performing the 16th action. And when it starts up the estimation algorithm now, the one that's searching over uh, the space of possible simulations, this is what that population looks like. It's converged, right? All of the models are, oh, they're so close, you can't even see the difference anymore. Yeah. Oddly, if you look carefully, you'll notice that they're all slightly wrong in the same way. Yeah? This seems a little bit worrying. The theory says we should be converging on the correct model. It's converged all right. It's got a whole, a whole bunch of slight variations of this bent version. Why are they all bent in slightly the same way? Thinking about thinking is misleading. Why didn't it converge on the, per, on the perfect model where all it's a perfect cross? All of the legs are perfectly straight, northwest, east, and south. They're a little bent here. If you sat down, or as you did last week, and sat down and made the quadruped, you'd make everything at perfect right angles. This process didn't. Why not? Because there's differences between sim and real, right? It's obvious to us, it's obvious that the model should have converged on a perfect cross, right? Thinking about thinking is misleading. From the robot's point of view, this is not, maybe not perfectly correct, but it's actually more correct than the perfect cross. Because if you look at the physical robot, obviously there's a slight difference in mass distribution. The shape of the legs obviously don't look like this. It's bending the materials that we gave it to better approximate the reality of the physical robot. This was, there were many surprises when we carried out this experiment. This was, to me, this was the one that was most surprising. I spent weeks banging my head against this, what, thinking there was a bug in my code. Why did it keep consistently converging? It was converging, which was good, but converging on the wrong model, which was bad, right? Took a while to realize that the physical robot was trying to tell me this is the correct model from my perspective, not from your perspective, right? Distal and proximal perspectives. Okay. All right. That's a lot of lead up to where we normally start when we talk about an experiment, which is now we have a simulation, this one, and we're going to evolve neural controllers on that simulation. So here is the exploitation algorithm. 
exploiting the evolved simulator. I've skipped ahead to the end of the exploitation algorithm. You know how this goes. It's evolving populations of controllers. In this case, to move from the left to the right as quickly as possible. And this is what it comes up with. So far, so good? OK. So now we've seen uh, exploration, exploitation, round and around and around 16 times. And then one run of the, explore, uh, the exploitation algorithm to produce this. <coughs> we crossed the gap. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. We spent three years working on this project. This was uh, close to the end of the third year. It took us a long, long time to get to this point. It took us a long, long time to get to this point. It's about 3 a.m. in the lab. We were all exhausted. Finally crossed the gap. There were three of us. Started going crazy, screaming and shouting. There was an undergrad sitting at a lab bench working on something else. Turned around, was watching us freak out about this robot and said, dude, that's the evil starfish. <laughs> so ever since, the nickname for this has been the, the evil starfish. Yes, question. How do we choose that physical shape? How do we choose that physical shape? So I chose it because it's a combination of intuitive and non-intuitive parts. It's got four legs, but it's not bilaterally symmetric like a mammal is. So hopefully you've come across this now with the quadruped in uh, Pi Bullet. It's not immediately obvious to see how to write a controller, how to manually program a gate into this robot. Part of, we use this robot for some other projects as well. We also used it as a, as a demonstrator for evolutionary robotics. If you don't know what the answer is, it's not so intuitive, it's hard to derive the answer by first principles makes sense to, to go searching for the answer. So we use this robot because most engineers, if we say program a gate for this robot, they say, oh, it's trivial. It's got four legs. I'm going to get it to canter or trot or walk. They sit down to try and do that. It doesn't work on this machine. Right? Uh, I was working with a PhD student on this project. We locked Victor in the lab overnight. We gave him 12 hours. We gave him food and water. We gave him 12 hours said, you're a very talented engineer. You programmed this thing to move as quickly as possible. And he did pretty well. He came up, I don't have time to show you that gate. He came up with a pretty good gate, but it wasn't as fast as this one. OK. Any other questions about this before we move on? OK. OK. This project was used to cross the simulation to reality gap, but it was actually a project that was funded by NASA, and NASA's not that interested in the sim to real gap. NASA's interested in a very different problem, which is we invest millions or billions of taxpayer dollars into the next generation of robot probes, we package them on a rocket, we send them to a moon in the outer solar system, it takes years to get there, the rover is just about to touch down on uh, uh, Enceladus, let's say, and it comes in a little bit too fast, hits the ground a little bit too quickly, and a wheel snaps off the rover, or a leg snaps off the rotor, or a blade snaps off uh, a quadcopter. Something serious goes wrong on landing. You've got years and years of effort, billions of taxpayer dollars on the line, NASA funded this project as a potential method of last resort, meaning something really bad happens. The probe can maybe still send back some telemetry to Earth, but maybe it can't directly report what's gone wrong. Perhaps the camera can't see what's happened. The probe just says, I was supposed to move one meter forward, and my accelerometer says, I ain't moving. Something's wrong. I don't know what's wrong. Here's the telemetry. Mission control goes through all of that telemetry for weeks. Still can't, mission control can't figure out what's wrong. We're on the, the brink of complete mission failure. 
only under those circumstances might NASA decide to cede control to the robot itself. You figure it out. What's gone wrong, right? Okay, so, so what I'm going to show you now is we're going to just keep the algorithm going that I've shown you so far. We're going to keep, uh, we're going to keep alternating between evolving descriptions of self, simulations, and actions. But now, self has changed. We sent Victor, the grad student, in with a screwdriver, and he mechanically separated the lower part of the right leg. You'll notice that the motor is actually still attached. So the robot can still send commands to that motor back there, but obviously it's not going to do anything. So the robot's situation has changed. What do you think happens if we just keep running this process? How are the models going to adapt, and how are the actions going to adapt? Absolutely. Absolutely. This peak is going to, at the beginning, is going to start dropping, right? Because the simulation, the, the, the simulation says the robot is four is four-legged, but now it's three and a half legged. So as it starts to accumulate new experiences in the damaged state, those new experiences are actually disproving the previous model. And you're right, it goes back to some version of what we had before. There are multiple explanations that are trying to span the original undamaged data set and the increasingly large, more recent data set con containing damaged experiences. Yeah, everybody see that? Okay, here we go. The robot starts thinking it's a four-legged robot. It actually got lucky and came up with the right answer, but for various reasons it lost that. At one point, it thought that the leg had shrunk. <coughs> that doesn't make physical sense. So it also, that model didn't last very long in the population. And at the end of this video, you'll see it's reconverged back to a fitness peak where it knows that it's a three and a half legged robot. Question? You, you could, right? So we built that in as kind of a switch in the code. It could be that mission control says, delete all your previous experiences and start from scratch again. But it's hard to know whether that's a good thing to do or not. So we just kept things simple and said, just keep going. And eventually, your more recent experiences hopefully will outweigh your old experiences and you'll converge on the right answer. It didn't actually throw it out. If you look very carefully, it shrunk the piece. One of the ways we allowed the simulators, uh, we, one of the ways we allowed the estimation algorithm to alter the simulations is to actually increase and decrease the size of pieces, which seems crazy because, of course, the one thing that can't go wrong to the rover is have one part of its body shrunk, right? So we're actually giving it a physically impossible alteration. Why would we do such a crazy thing? You, you, absolutely, you can kind of ignore it. It also gives evolution another knob to tune the mass distribution of the robot. Depending on where NASA sends, uh, if, if NASA sends legged probes, or even wheeled, uh, wheeled probes, it turns out that it's possible during uh, motion for a leg or a wheel to get stuck in mud or something gets, uh, rocks get glommed into or stuck into the, the chassis. So it's possible that actually during movement, the leg can increase in mass. Maybe not increase, actually, yeah, increase in volume. So by allowing it to actually change the size of body parts, that actually provides a way for the simulation to explain other things. I stuck my leg in some mud, and now my leg is bigger and heavier than it was before. Or I came in too hot, and part of my leg broke off, or I'm dragging my leg. Di different ways we could allow evolution to alter the simulation. And again, assuming NASA ends up using these approaches, they would build in a lot of domain knowledge. 
Okay. So uh, we go back and forth, around and around and around, and at this point in phase two of the experiment, the damaged phase, it's discovered that it's a three and a half legged robot. When it starts up, <clears throat> when it starts up the exploitation algorithm, that third algorithm that's evolving controllers on the best evolved simulator, what happens? What do you think happens to the controller that produced that gate for the four legged robot before? The exploitation algorithm is trying to exploit the simulator to evolve controllers to get the robot to move forward. It found one that worked for the four-legged robot. What happens now when we restart the exploitation algorithm? We find that that gate didn't work. Absolutely, right? So like before, the fitness of that controller suddenly drops because when it's tested on this three-and-a-half-legged robot, it doesn't work. And eventually, in this particular run of the experiment, it came up with this solution, which we may or may not be able to see. OK, apologies. Let's go back again. It came up with this gate. You're all experts now in evolving controllers and simulation. There are many, many things wrong with this particular controller. What's one of them? The controller moves the robot from left to right, which is exactly what we wanted. It's high fitness. Absolutely. Motors are too strong, for sure. What else? <clears throat> Friction's pretty high. Yeah, it's definitely higher than it, sh than it is in reality in this case. Other ideas? Yep, it absolutely did. Yeah, it's trying to it's trying to explain this change in mass distribution. Lot lots of changes here actually, not just quote unquote deleting that lower leg. It's also turning in a semicircle, right? Some of you might have seen this as well if you just evolved for forward locomotion. It doesn't necessarily need to do forward, it just needs to get a long distance in that direction. Yeah? Okay, so maybe we don't want it turning a semicircle, but for our purposes, we didn't really care. We just wanted to see that now this gate or this controller will transfer to reality. Motors are definitely, we're definitely, over, we overestimated the strength of the motors. Despite that, we still managed to cross the gap. Friction is lower. You can see it's slipping a lot more than it did before. Not bad, yeah? So assuming that, assuming that this robot goes to Enceladus and takes enough computational power with it, it could, in theory, come up with no, new ways of moving. And if something almost catastrophic happens, something that we can't determine, the robot can't determine what's gone wrong, and we can't determine what's gone wrong, it can estimate or approximate what's gone wrong and come up with a compensating behavior. For NASA, this is what's most important. If we're on the edge of mission, complete mission failure, squeezing 50% or even 5% out of what it was originally supposed to do is much, much better than 0%. Questions? How far did you like, take it? Did you like, take off that motor or? Uh, this was as far as we went with the evil starfish. We're going to talk about soft robots in a few weeks from now. Soft robots are much more uh, resilient. I'll show you some soft robots that we cut in half and they're able to keep going. We'll get to that in a few weeks. Resilient machine, this is about as much as it could take. Okay. Today, obviously, it would be doing, done by an onboard computer or what NASA told us at the time is uh, don't even worry about doing it onboard. Send back the raw sensor data 
send back the raw sensor data to us at Mission Control, and we'll run this algorithm on Pleiades, which is NASA's supercomputer. We're going to assume that the robot and NASA has all the time in the world. There's no need for the robot to recover quickly, just recover. So time is not of the essence, and compute is not at the essence. If we're on the edge of losing billions of taxpayer dollars, we're more than happy to, to throw a huge amount of compute at it. And this cycle here might actually be between, between Earth up here and Enceladus down here, and it might be a several weeks between each of these, right? Doesn't, doesn't matter. It's assuming that something's gone wrong and the robot isn't in immediate danger. There are lots of other things that can go wrong, like for example, the robot is not actuating any of its motors, but its accelerometer is reporting that the robot is accelerating. What's happening? On Mars or on Enceladus, wherever this probe is. The robot is not moving, it's, it's not actuating any of its motors, but the robot's sensor is reporting that it is accelerating. The robot is accelerating. What's happening? One of several things, more than two. What could be what could be happening? It's sliding down, you know, the inside surface of a crater, right? It's falling. The accelerometer is maybe broken. One of those explore, explorations, I'm sliding down the side of a crater and I'm sliding down at, at a faster rate. You have to do something immediate. You don't have time to do this. Another open problem in evolutionary robotics and robotics in general is the time issue. I just showed you how this particular robot can figure out on its own something's gone wrong. My experiences are now what, not what they were before. And we've told the robot how to fix that problem. Not, not what the fix is, but how to fix it itself. But we built in an assumption that it's not urgent. You take all the time you need. One of the hardest things for robots and for us is knowing how much time do you have to fix the problem. If you're sliding down the side of a crater, you need to use a very different strategy than this. Right? If you're sitting quietly and comfortably and you have enough solar power, but you can't move or you can't figure out how to move yourself, this works. Yeah? Still a very open problem in robotics. Okay. Okay, we talked about this. Three evolutionary algorithms all at play. They are periodically querying the physical robot or the physical robot is running one of these three evolutionary algorithms depending on what's going on. Okay, we already had a look at all this. Okay, I just walked you through. All those videos that I just showed you correspond to this trial up here. That was the first trial. We went back and did this 29 more times to see how well, on average, the robot could figure out uh, a description of self. I'm showing you here only the, first, uh, only the first phase where it's intact. I'm not showing you the second phase where it's damaged. The outline is, again, that's our guess about the optimal model. You'll notice that in the bolded squares, which is a 13 of them, the robot came up with the correct description. It connected all the parts together in the right way. Some of these legs are bent, because again, we're not really clear uh, what the actual optimal model is. The other 17 cases, some of the body parts are connected in the wrong place. Presumably with more effort, more rounds of this, the, uh, the models would converge. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, in all of these 30 trials, we only allowed the physical robot to perform 16 actions. So this was the robot's understanding of itself at the end of 16 actions in each trial. I showed you this video uh, last week or the week before. We crossed the gap pretty well, but there were e even still, there were a few hiccups here because the model, again, is not perfect. Last slide I'm going to show you in this series. Uh, uh, you might have seen in the video that the robot was walking over clear plexiglass. When we performed these experiments, uh, what we did first, what we did first was download uh, 30 random controllers 
onto the physical intact robot. And we place the robot at this position on the plexiglass, an arbitrary position which was zero, zero. That's where the robot started. And we allowed the robot to move 30 times, being controlled by these 30 random controllers. And when the robot stopped moving after about 10 seconds, we lifted up the robot, and we put a red dot on the plexiglass at that point. Uh, you can see the distribution of red points is a little bit downward, which is actually forward, moving from the left to the right side of the table. So there's a little tilt in the table, or there's some bias in the robot that even with random controllers, it moves uh, a about one centimeter to the right. Uh, it didn't have an orientation sensor. The robot only has vestibular sensors. Yep. Oh, I see. Yeah, we always put it at the same orientation. Yep, good, good point. Actually, you're right. We probably should have put it at different rotations to cancel out the fact that it's not actually radially symmetric. Right? The mass distribution is a little bit asymmetric. Okay. We then drew black dots on the plexiglass based on 30 evolved controllers on uh, run on this model, sorry, on this model here. So we ran the exploitation algorithm 30 times. We gave the exploitation algorithm 30 attempts to come up with a controller that caused this virtual robot to move from the left side to the right side of the virtual table. So the black points are predictions. Right? The simulation says, I think this controller will cause the physical robot to move, in this case, 50 or 47 centimeters uh, along the table. Everybody see that? Okay. We took those 30 evolved controllers from simulation. We played them on the physical robot, producing 30 gates in reality. And at the end of 10 seconds for each of those 30 gates, we lifted up the robot and put a blue dot. So these are the predictions, and the blue are the actual results. I've circled one prediction from one controller and the actual result of that controller. So we actually crossed the reality gap about 50% here. The robot travel, traveled half as far to the right-hand side of the table as was predicted by the model. You can see that's generally true for most of the predictions and the actual results. So did we cross the gap? I don't know, we crossed about this much, maybe about a third, a third of the way. The reality gap is really, really, really tough. Okay, that concludes our discussion of the Resilient Machines project. Any questions before we move on? All good? Okay. We've got 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to start in on uh, lecture 18, which is another group's attempt to cross the reality gap. This was work reported in uh, 2010. This was four years after we published our, resu our uh, result on the Resilient Machines project. In the transferability project, they're going to ask the following question. Wouldn't it be great if we knew beforehand for every controller we're evolving in simulation, not just how far it caused, causes the simulated robot to move, but how transferable does the evolutionary algorithm think it should be, right? For your controllers at the moment, you have no idea how transferable they are other than just you visually inspecting that controller. What if the evolutionary algorithm was able to raise its hand and assign two numbers to every controller, displacement in simulation and likelihood of transferability. Yeah? That's what they're going to attempt here. Okay, if you could do such a thing, then you should be able to evolve controllers to maximize both numbers, displacement in simulation and transferability. Sounds nice. It's an obvious problem with this. What is it? How do you define transferability? Well, actually, that's not too hard. 
Transferability is going to be what you, you just saw with the black and the blue dots. Difference between how far that controller causes the simulated robot to move and how far it causes the physical robot to move. You can actually define transferability relatively easily. That's not the hard part. What's the hard part? Absolutely. So why are we even using simulation? If we're going to try, if we're going to measure the transferability of every single controller by having to run it in reality, we no longer need a simulation, and we're back to the 1990s of just doing everything on the physical machine. It's a bit of a catch-22 here, right? Okay. So again, I'm just going to introduce this idea to you today. We'll dive into it in detail next time. I'm going to show you how they get around this. There's a bit of a cheat that you can use to get around it. For now, let's just assume that we do have a measure of transferability. One, uh, one that's with, uh, fitness is going to reward desired behavior like displacement. And the second number, the transferability, is going to reward for similarities between simulated and real behavior. Seems kind of counterintuitive because, again, how do we know what real behavior is unless we run it on the real machine? Just take my word for it for the moment. Let's assume that we can. Okay. So every, every controller now, we're going to try it. We're going to assign two numbers to it, not just one. Displacement and transferability. Okay. How are we going to optimize both numbers simultaneously? We're going to use MU, multi-objective optimization. This is, uh, I think this is the last evolutionary algorithm we're going to see in this course. It's a very powerful, uh, actually, class of algorithms that are useful when you have not just one number to describe the fitness or the quality of a solution to your problem, but you have multiple numbers. You have multiple objectives that you would like to optimize, multi-objective optimization. How does this work? Let's look at an example of multi-objective optimization with our two objectives, behavior or displacement and transferability. We imagine these two objectives and we draw this visually. We can put these two objectives on two axes. We can create a random population of controllers and again, assuming that we can estimate, assuming that we can come up with those two numbers for each controller, how far it travels in simulation and how transferable it is. We have two numbers associated with each controller. We're going to treat those two numbers as coordinates in this 2D plane. And we can then just plot all of our random controllers. Which ones are good and which ones are bad here? How many do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. We've got 12 controllers here. Imagine we have a population size of 12. We're looking at 12 controllers, some which are more transferable than others, some, are, some which cause the virtual robot to travel faster than others. What's the best controller here among the 12? Depends on which one you prioritize. If we don't prioritize either, then I'm asking you a trick question, right? There is no one best controller in this population. However, there are some that are better than others. Which ones are better and which are worse? You can use a Pareto front. For those that don't know that term, we're going to introduce it in a mere moment. Absolutely. So the easiest, easier thing is to think about the ones that are less, are not that good, which are the ones that are closer to the origin, right? Lower and to the left is bad. Up and to the right is good. At this point in time, this is an evolutionary algorithm, so we need to delete the bad ones and make randomly modified copies of the good ones. So we could delete the ones that are close. We could delete the ones that are closer to the lower left, the ones that are closer to the origin. 
and allow the ones that are further from the origin to survive. And in multi-objective optimization, we're going to do this in a very specific way. We're going to visit each of these 12 controllers, and we're going to tag it with a binary tag. And this tag's name is dominated or non-dominated. We're going to determine which solutions are dominated by which other ones. Let's visit this particular controller down here. When we visit this controller, we're then going to look at all the other 11 controllers. And if among those 11 controllers, there is one controller that is more transferable and more fit, causes the virtual robot to travel faster, then we say that this particular controller dominates this <coughs> controller, and we tag this controller as a dominated controller. Everybody see that? OK. We visit this one. This one is dominated by this one, and this one, and this one. We keep going. There are some that are going to resist domination. So this controller, for example, there is a controller that's more transferable than it is. It's this one. This one is more transferable than this one. But this one is worse in terms of objective two. So this one does not dominate this one. In order to be dominated, you have to find another solution that's better than you at everything. This one is better at objective two than this one, but worse than at objective one than this one. Question? Uh, how is that um, dominated one underneath the, the mouse? Which one is that dominated by? Good question. So you stole my punchline for today, which is there's a typo on this slide. One of them is non-dominated, is shown as being dominated, but it's actually non-dominated. You found it. Thank you. So I'm going to end by just pointing out what Jordan said. If you take all the non-dominated solutions, including this one, and you connect them by a line, you get a front. Yeah, That's known as the Pareto front. P-A-R-E-T-O. P-A-R-E-T-O, named after the economist Pareto. We'll talk about Pareto and his front next time. You have a quiz due tonight. You're working on the first of four deliverables for your final project. Have a great rest of your week. See you on Tuesday.